Welcome to the Columbia County Citizens for Human Dignity District 1 Candidates Forum. My name is Craig Frazier. I am uh, one of your co-hosts. joined tonight by Barbara Dudley. You'll be introduced to her in just a few minutes. CCCHD has been an important organization here in Columbia County, enhancing and promoting democracy while focusing on issues that are critical to progressive rural citizens. To that end, we are here tonight. Our country is at a pivotal crossroad in our history. The elections that are going to occur in 2011, here in November, November 8th, 2012 will begin in, uh, here in January when uh, we elect our new congressperson, uh, along with probably some other primaries that are happening uh, nationally. But these elections will redefine the role and scope of government in our society. Our elected leaders will be asked to make crucial decisions regarding the future of health care, educating our children, military deployments, social security, rebuilding America's infrastructure, creating a fairer tax structure for families and businesses, and most importantly, putting our people back to work in living wage jobs. We need to elect courageous leaders who will stand up and advocate for programs important to the financial security of people of the 1st Congressional District. Tonight we have the opportunity to hear from several candidates who seek to represent us in Congress. We have an opportunity to ask them important questions regarding issues important to us. The strength of a democracy is in an educated citizenry that actively participates in the election process. Tonight we will hear from the candidates so that each of us can make a more informed decision as to who will be the stronger advocate for the citizens of the 1st Congressional District. It is through the ballot box that each of us can have our voices heard in the decisions about the future direction of our government. Next we want to practice what we preach. Each month the Rural Organizing Project sends out suggestions for a kitchen table conversation that we can hold with our family, our friends, and our neighbors. Therefore, tonight, we are inviting all of you to listen in on a kitchen table conversation between the candidates and some members uh, who have been asked to represent participating organizations. I want to start by saying that there are four candidates here with us. There are other candidates as well. Um, in this race, but uh, we invited all the candidates, and these are the four who responded to our invitation and filled out our questionnaire. So we are very happy to have them here. Down to the heart of the matter, we have five people up here who are not running for office, but who want something from the people who represent them in Congress. Um, and so we are going to go one at a time um, with the people who are up here at the table. They also will speak for two minutes and at the end of that we'll ask a question. I will then direct that question to each of the candidates and I've sort of created a rotation so to try and be fair in terms of who answers when. Um, and the candidates will each have a minute and a half to respond. I am also tasked with making sure you really do respond. So if I think your minute and a half is, is not directed at the question posed to you, I'll give you a second shot for another few seconds. Okay, our first uh, testifier and questioner is Diane Dillard. My name's Diane Dillard. I worked at the local paper mill for 44 years. The mill was built by my husband's grandfather in 1925 and operated for 80 plus years providing thousands of jobs. When I arrived there in 1964, there were 640 people working around the clock to produce paper, a commodity each and every one of you use every day, from facial and toilet tissue to writing in computers, packaging, medical products, and so on. When the mill downsized, forced by outside economics, the mill no longer paid property taxes of $3 million a year. That was money that used to go to build roads and maintain infrastructure and build schools. We no longer paid a million dollars a month to the city of St. Helens for the secondary treatment plant. 
We no longer paid a million a month in electrical fees. And we discontinued paying uh, donations to this community. My budget was two hundred to two hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year that we gave to CASA, Red Cross, the United Way. And of course, most of all, the social aspect was that three hundred and fifty plus people lost their jobs and many had to move. Well, also think of the local contractors who washed our windows, provided electrical maintenance, truck drivers who haul chips in and paper out. And think of the food service people, the restaurants who bought lunch, who helped us with safety celebrations for thousands. All those people didn't get orders anymore. We produced 350 tons of paper every month that now had to produce by someone else, many of them outside of the United States. So this is just simply a thumbprint on jobs in Columbia County, a high helicopter view of what this community and our United States lost. Since 1964, several hundred paper mills in the United States have shuttered their operations. So magnify this loss in Columbia County by thousands. It's simply Economics 101. Jobs create wealth, and we've lost our wealth. My question for the candidates is, what steps will you take as an elected official to see that jobs are retained and new jobs are created in this great Pacific Northwest? Thank you. And to begin with, I'm going to just go in the order in which you are seated. So I'm going to begin with the W's get to start always at some point, right? Brad Witt. Thank you very much. Uh, Diane, um, I uh, began my uh, working career in the forest products industry, the solid wood side of things. And I think that it is absolutely crucial uh, that we begin managing um, our nation's forests, our federal forests, both Forest Service and BLM, uh, for forest health. And if we manage it on that basis, then all of the values that we, any one of us in this room would hope to obtain out of that forest uh, will um, uh, be taken care of and we will be able uh, to realize economic uh, as well as natural resource values. I also think in terms of job creation that it's um, critically important uh, that our nation uh, be focused right now on investments in critical infrastructures um, in our economy uh, in terms of energy, transportation, communication, and our public buildings. We need to be investing uh, in those infrastructures now uh, so that by the end of the uh, decade, we have the most efficient and modern infrastructure of any nation in the world. And I would dedicate uh, the Bush uh, tax cuts. I would end them and begin those investments now. I believe that there is too much waste with federal government spending our money. A good example of that is the I-5 crossing. They have already spent $140 million, not one shovel in the ground. That's just research and development. We don't need that bridge in these times. We have the 205. That, they want to build a temporary bridge at the I-5 so that the traffic can get across. We have a temporary bridge, it's called the 205. That's $140 million. That would be $141 million projects that we can use in our state. That is a waste. Right now we need to cut down on projects that are being researched and developed until we get the economy moving again. If you put $140 million into this economy, you will create jobs. People will start buying houses. They will start building things. Jobs depend on work. The moment that you cut all the waste out and have common sense projects that are actually putting people to work, $850 billion stimulus package. If that would have been divided in 50 ways that every state would have got an equal share. That would have been $170 billion that would have come to the state of Oregon. How, how many jobs would that be? 
Thank you. Let me give you what I think are two crucial pieces to getting people back to work. The first is that we in Oregon and as a nation, we need to have the best trained, most ready workforce that you can find anywhere on the globe. And that's why last year I brought together the very diverse coalition to bring the bill to return the shop classes to our middle schools and high schools. Because of that effort, next year at least 10 schools in Oregon will have fully restored shop class programs and over a 10 year period every school in the state is what we're moving to. The other is the WPA program that I'm proposing that'll take the roughly 200,000 people that are out of work now and get them to work rebuilding the infrastructure of our state and our country. But Diane, in particular, I really want to thank you for sharing your family's story because the story of the Oregon Mills is really the story of the loss of a lot of culture, uh, of the, the Oregon culture. Um, we need to respect the fact that it's the timber industry that built this state in many ways. And it's why that I've, I've spent so much time with Hampton Lumber Affiliates at their mill in Tillamook, helping them build a program that brings high school and college kids into their mill to teach them how to work in a 21st century mill again. We can be harvesting out of burn zones. We can be thinning our forests. We can looking, be looking at new ways with tree farms to support the pulp and paper industry. And here's the best one. Why in the world are we sending our logs to China and Japan under unfair trade deals when we could be milling them here in Oregon. Yes, we need to get people back to work on infrastructure projects. We need the jobs and we need to rebuild our roads and bridges, electrical grids, water systems. That's important. But not everybody does those jobs. And so we also need to help small businesses. This is something that I worked on in the Oregon legislature, helping small businesses keep and retain jobs here in Oregon by giving them loans through a public-private partnership that allows them to manufacture and keep jobs right here in Oregon. Uh, just a couple weeks ago, we heard from a clothing company in Portland that got a loan through this program. They're manufacturing clothing right here in Portland. McMinnville, a water company, bottling mineral water. These are Oregon jobs, and we need to expand the opportunities for small businesses uh, across the state, and not just across the 1st Congressional District, but across the state. We also have a work share program here in Oregon that helps businesses retain employees and uh, helps the employees stay on the job. We passed Cool Schools, which is a bill that will create jobs for people retrofitting schools to make them more energy efficient, which will save money in the long run. And finally, we need to rebuild consumer confidence. I've been standing up for consumers my entire career. If we can rebuild consumer confidence by having strong consumer protection laws, I was glad to hear that Good Grief America is one of the co-sponsors of this, then we'll start having uh, jobs and a thriving economy again. There are 22.7 million people that are at the VA. He has had five doctors in one year. They don't even call him to review his medical test. He has to keep calling and calling and calling until they will review his test. The VA is doing the best they can, and I appreciate having the VA, and he loves going to the VA. He's a veteran. He, they, he wants to go to the VA. But 22 million people, people are going to fall through the cracks. I do countless hours of community service. I have raised a lot of money for Salud. Salud is a health organization that takes care of farm workers. They give free health care to farm workers. You do need health care here. I was at a forum Saturday morning at Terwilliger Plaza, and they were asked a question, how many people want their taxes raised? And a lot of people in there wanted their taxes raised to help others. I asked them, if you really want to help others, let me know, because I would love to start a program. I would love to start a health clinic here using local funds to fund that clinic and bring doctors here and dentists that you need. Thank you. The health care bill that was passed by Congress and supported by President Obama was just a small step in the right direction. It covered more children. It got rid of the pre-existing condition clauses so that more people can get treatment, and that was a good thing. But it also took a huge step in the wrong direction, 
as a billion dollar boon for the insurance industry by forcing everybody to buy from private insurance. Now I know what it takes to take on the big insurance companies. I did it for many years as a civil rights attorney. I did it in the state legislature when I helped pass the bill forcing insurance companies to finally cover breast cancer screenings for women. So I know what it takes to take them on. What I am hoping is that Congress doesn't think this is the end of the discussion. Because as your representative, the next discussion is going to be a strong public option to compete with those insurance companies, leading to a Medicare for all system that gives all of you the same exact coverage that any congressman gets in DC. And when I was in the House uh, in Oregon, I served on the House Health Care Committee and heard a lot of testimony about the challenges in rural areas. I agree that the Affordable Care Act only was the first step, and we absolutely need to work toward a public option. I was disappointed when that didn't pass. But in the state legislature, we did some good work that I'll take with me to Congress, working on things like telemedicine, like a rural liability fund that helps subsidize the insurance premiums for doctors in rural areas. And in the health care transformation bill that we passed this last session, we're going to start making changes in community care to make sure that people are getting care in the most cost-effective way possible so that they aren't going to emergency rooms to get their care. That's going to help lower the costs and make uh, health care more accessible. There's an insurance exchange now being developed in Oregon that's going to help individuals and small businesses be able to purchase insurance. And finally, we absolutely need to have on the federal level the prescription drug uh, plan like we have in Oregon to pool so that we get better rates on prescription drugs. And finally, this last session we passed uh, some legislation to help uh, programs to recruit physicians and providers to rural areas. We need to have those incentives so that health care is accessible to everyone across the first district and across the state of Oregon and across this country. Vastly too often in this country, we're seeing people that have to forego uh, medical care simply because they cannot afford it. We spend an enormous amount of money in this country on health care, about double that uh, most of the rest of the industrialized world spends. Yet our health care is rated about 13th to 16th in the world. And we're spending a lot of money and not getting the kinds of, of care that our citizenry so desperately needs. I see a friend in the audience tonight who whose mill closed down and was unable uh, to afford um, health care. He has a very serious back problem and um, spent much of the summer sleeping on his front lawn because he could not get relief any other way. When he became old enough to qualify for Medicare, he now has medical treatment, and he has good medical treatment. And this suggests that our government needs to be looking after all of us. We need the kind of medical care for everyone that Medicare provides for older folks. Navigating systems like Social Security and insurance is a huge source of stress, especially since I'm disabled myself by chronic illnesses that severely limit my energy. One problem that's been going on for three and a half years involves a Social Security overpayment. It was their error, but my sister got a letter saying she owed $2,000. We jumped through all the hoops to try to work something out, but because they lost the waiver reconsideration paperwork we filled out twice, they withheld the money. This happened right when she had reached the top of the waiting list for NOAA, the Northwest Oregon <clears throat> Housing Authority that uses federal funds to subsidize housing costs, and she needed the money to move into her own apartment. I've always heard that your congressional office is the place to go for help with problems like this, but for two years, Congressman Wu's office has had this case and did a very poor job of trying to resolve it. Compared to many other disabled Oregon res residents, my sister is one of the lucky ones. She has excellent service providers, insurance coverage, housing, and me to advocate for her. But keeping her safety net intact is an ongoing battle. A few months after she moved into her apartment, she was caught up in the local housing crisis when no one informed her and hundreds of others that they would lose their subsidies. 
That was resolved, but problems with coordinating Medicare, Medicaid, and private insurance never end. When my cousins in Canada tell me how smoothly their medical coverage works, I'm envious. When I hear in the news that some of our leaders want to make even deeper cuts to these programs, I'm afraid for our future. Programs like Social Security, Medicare, and NOAA ensure a basic standard of dignity for struggling Americans. There has been talk on the national level of cutting these programs as part of deficit reduction. My question is twofold. Do you feel that changes are needed to avoid predicted shortfalls, and can you cite specific proposals for changes in taxes or benefits that you would support, and others that you would fight to protect the security of our most vulnerable citizens? Also, on a local level, what would you do to make sure your office did a better job helping individual constituents resolve problems with government bureaucracies? When I was a civil rights attorney, a large part of my practice was helping people with social security claims. I have stood next to folks like you trying to get their benefits through a system that oftentimes just seems completely uncaring and way too unwieldy for somebody to take on by themselves. So, as your next representative, I think it's going to be incredibly important to focus on a system that can be more accommodating for people. But Social Security is not a system that's going to run out of money tomorrow. We need to make sure in the long run that, that it's solvent, but we've got another 27 years to, wor to work that out when we've got immediate problems right now to be working on. Medicare is a little bit uh, different. Medicare, we ought to do bulk purchasing in order to bring down the cost. We need a strong public option that can compete with the insurance companies in Part D. Uh, we need to do a better job of uh, creating more efficient uh, and preventative types of health care um, treatments so that we don't end up with folks with bigger uh, problems later. But the second part of your question is what's so important. Because so many folks go to Washington, D.C., and that becomes their home. This is my home. I will have staff that are here to work with people and although it drives my staff crazy on the team, I give my cell phone number to everybody. It's 503-970-9296. <laughs> as a candidate and as your representative, you use it anytime you want. There's a challenge. Um, Suzanne. Thank you. Artists, first of all, thank you so much for the work that you're doing helping uh, take care of your sister. Uh, I, I know that's tough work and I'm sure it's very much appreciated. Uh, I've worked on affordable housing uh, issues in the legislature, increasing affordable housing and making sure that those who need housing uh, have, have access when possible. Uh, but one thing I want to make perfectly clear here is that we are not in this situation that we're in now economically because of the middle class and those struggling to get by. And I'm not interested in balancing the budget on their backs. Throughout my career, I've been standing up for working families, consumers, those in need. Uh, and we, I, we absolutely can make taking care of those uh, who need our help uh, 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 important and make that a priority. So you asked two changes, are there, or two questions. Are there changes needed? Yes, absolutely. We need to close loopholes. Uh, and stop giving tax breaks to those who don't need them and the Bush tax cuts on the wealthiest and make it a priority to take care of those who need our help, middle class families, those who are vulnerable. And secondly, you asked about what we will do uh, to help with constituent issues. You know, I've been helping all the way back to my early career at uh, Legal Aid, helping families in need, helping to connect them with the services that they need and the assistance that they need. And I make that a priority as a legislator as well. And I will commit to having a strong office uh, to deal with constituent issues. Anyone who comes in will get uh, the attention that they deserve or comes in or calls in. Thank you. The question of whether we need uh, changes uh, with regard to um, access for, uh, for medical care uh, absolutely. I had um, uh, an acquaintance uh, in the Astoria area uh, who went missing for several days and a mutual acquaintance of both of ours said that she had not seen her for a period of four days. I asked her to uh, pay a visit uh, to her door and found that um, she was ridden in bed uh, from a potentially fatal disease. Uh, Together, um, we sought help from the Oregon Health Plan, uh, got this individual enrolled, and today she's li living a, a fairly normal, 
uh, uh, life. And um, we have the Oregon Health Plan uh, to thank for, for making this all possible. Uh, I think that uh, one of the changes that we need, uh, we need to make sure that every single citizen uh, in this country uh, has access to health care. And the only way that we are going to assure that uh, is to have a public option for health care available here in this country. Uh, in terms of fighting for the vulnerable, um, I've uh, provided um, uh, help for the local food bank, uh, for my union's food bank, for the women's shelters here in Columbia County, uh, as well as Clatsop County, um, food, clothing, shelter, whatever it takes. So yes. Um, for the first part of the question, um, I believe that Social Security needs to stay exactly as it is for now. But the younger people should be able to privatize their Social Security and get it into their own hands so that they can use those funds to the best of their ability. I also feel that the money should not be filtered down from the federal government. All those Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid dollars should stay within the state. We should only be uh, financing national defense and protection of our rights. When we filter money through the federal government and it comes down, we don't see a lot of those dollars. They're taken from us. If we kept the money in the state of Oregon, we would see a lot more of our own money. Oregon knows how to take care of Oregonians. And as far as Wu goes, I think he did a lot more wrong than not answer calls. I definitely not only would have a staff, but I would have several people volunteering to help set up programs to solve problems. I would have a problem-solving staff available 24 hours so that people could call in and you would get answers. My name is Yesenia Sanchez and I have been calling St. Helens, Oregon my home for the last 14 years. Um, my family moved to Oregon from California and they started a small business um, that through, through the years and with a lot of hard work became a favorite place to eat for a lot of people in our town. I graduated from the University of Oregon and um, started working at Community Action Team this year. I am the president of Latinos Unidos para un Futuro Mejor, and I am also a board member of the Rural Organizing Project. Let me look at my notes real quick. <laughs> Politicians often like to play on the fear of their constituents and push wedge issues um, that are very complex, such as the link between immigration and the economy and polarize our communities. Um, here in Columbia County, we experienced just that in 2008 and 2009 with two ballot measures that created a very hostile environment for both immigrant families, working families, and businesses. With our organizing efforts and rural organizing project, Pecun, Causa, um, the ACLU, we defeated those measures in court. And, um, Part of the mission of Latinos Unidos para un Futuro Mejor is to unite the community around the idea that both documented and undocumented immigrants alike are contributing members of their communities with strong social values that culturally and economically enrich our nation. We envision a society where we can look to each other as neighbors, friends and family instead of enemies and look for local solutions together when we talk about how we want to pull forward. I want to bring heart back into the conversation of immigration and remind everyone that when you hear talk about illegals, that you realize that you're talking about people with hopes and dreams, not just a barrier to a problem. With that, candidates, I would like to ask two questions. Do you agree that it is wrong to scapegoat our immigrant family and neighbors for our economic problems? And what proposals will you bring to Congress regarding immigration and the role of immigrants in our economy in our communities? Thank you so much, Yesenia, for your question and for all you're doing for the community. Uh, and as a fellow U of O grad, go Ducks. Uh, so, 
I, and I want to find out where the restaurant is, too. Uh, so, yes, it's wrong, absolutely wrong to scapegoat immigrants. And when I hear about some of the hateful things that are happening in other states currently, uh, I want to make absolutely sure that those things are not going to happen in the first congressional district or in Oregon. I told you before, my grandparents came over here on a boat looking for a, a better life. Why do people come here? They come here for opportunity, for the American dream. And I, and I share that concern that, that we should not be scapegoating people. Yes, we need to watch the borders, and yes, we need to crack down on those inhumane people who are bringing people over in terrible, terrible, unsafe situations. But in our community, we need to look to build bridges. And in Congress, I will support uh, the DREAM Act, just as I supported tuition equity in the Oregon legislature. Not only did I support it, I stood up and co-sponsored and spoke in favor of it. I believe that uh, offering resident tuition to students here who graduate from Oregon schools and are accepted to an Oregon university is the right thing to do, and I will support that in Congress. I will also support a path to citizenship uh, for those who are here. Uh, I think that's a very, very important thing to do to make sure that we're sending the message that we value all in our communities. Thank you. Brad Witt. We are a nation of immigrants, and immigrants are what has made this country great. It is their blood, sweat, and tears uh, that have built this country. Uh, in my own family's instance, uh, the first... Um, uh, immigrants from my father's side uh, arrived in this country in 1638. On my mother's side of the family, uh, the most recent immigrants arrived just um, prior to World War I, and uh, my grandfather got here just in time uh, to serve in that war um, as an American soldier. And when he was done, uh, he was a full-fledged American citizen. Uh, and we need to use this as, as a model in this country of providing a path to citizenship uh, for all of our immigrants, uh, for those who live here, who pay the taxes, who participate in our communities, who participate in our schools and our sports, and are full-fledged members of our community with one exception. They don't have that legal document. And they need the opportunity to obtain that uh, because it will make them better off, it will make our nation better off. And for those who, like my grandfather, served in the service, or for those who have completed a couple years of college education here as legal residents, and who don't have a criminal background, we need to make them full-fledged American citizens. Well, I don't know if anyone's noticed, but I am 100% Hispanic. <laughs> and. The Hispanic community is a beautiful community. It's a hard-working community. Hispanic people are hard workers. Good family people. I have a solution. And my solution is for everyone who is here, and they are a law-abiding citizen, and they are part of our communities, then there we secure our borders. I do believe no one wants the violence coming across that border that border should be secure number one number two for everyone here that has lived here that is a law-abiding citizen they apply for citizenship immediately and along with that every state decides several community service hours and they have a list of what the uh, illegal aliens can do for community service and that can be an array of whatever that state chooses. It can be like the things I do, where I work for the Henderson House and Juliet House in McMinnville. I do, I've raised hundred, over $100,000 for cancer research, 65,000 for college scholarships. Whatever they decide to do, when they complete their community service and they complete the correct path to citizenship, they are the same. They don't owe anyone anything, no one gave them anything. Thank you very much. I am so pleased, not just that you asked the question, but that you asked it the way that you did. Because I thought it was a beautiful thing to think of America as a country with a heart again. And, and I'm glad that you said it. No, of course it's wrong to scapegoat. 
you know, my family immigrated here just like all of yours did, unless any of our Native American friends are in the crowd. My grandfather Avak Avakian fled genocide and oppression in Armenia and made his way through Ellis Island. He was a carpenter. He had a large family. Seven of his sons became electricians or carpenters. And I remember my dad taking me through the streets of Fresno when I was a kid and saying, you see that neighborhood over there that was built by your grandfather and your uncles. Immigrants have built this country and that needs to be respected. And for those that are in the country now that are following the laws, that are working, that are contributing to our communities, what they need is an efficient way towards citizenship. The other is this, and it's why I said, I'm so glad you said the thing about America with the heart. Where did we become a country of exclusion and divisiveness when it comes to welcoming people into our communities. Let's be a country of inclusion again. And let's find a legitimate and efficient pathway to citizenship for those folks who want to be here and contribute to our communities. Hi, my name is Joe Lewis. I've been a member of the Columbia County Citizens for, of, for Human Dignity for 14 years. I'm currently the chair of the Scapu School Board. I've also been an employee of the city of Scappoose for 30 years. In that time, the city has tripled in population while the workforce has stayed about the same size. Most of the water and sewer related infrastructure is 50 or 60 years old. This has meant that our crews have been patching our raw water line every year, yet with no reserve fund, there is little hope of replacing it. Only the very worst streets in the city are fixed owing to a lack of funds. I'm deeply concerned that we are being neglectful stewards of our public resources. We are developing a track record of underfunding infrastructure and demonizing public workers to the point that these systems begin to fail. In our county, we see this in water, education, and public safety. Our classrooms in Scapoose, some of them have 30 students. We have no librarians in our school libraries. Cuts in wages are year after year because of furlough days. On a good day, our sheriff's department can have two deputies on patrol, one in North County, one in South County, a spread of 62 miles. To take the example of water, in other countries where water infrastructure was neglected to the point of losing its ability to deliver drinking water to the citizens, private for-profit companies have taken over and delivered water only to the wealthy who could afford to pay their exorbitant charges. The same is true for education and public safety. Do you have the same concerns that I do about our neglect for public infrastructure leading us towards third world standards and privatization? And what can we do in the United States to avoid this chain of events? Well, Joe, we're uh, very fortunate to have someone as yourself as chair of the school board because it is abundantly obvious that you care very deeply. Uh, and as I uh, indicated earlier, the way that we get ourselves out of the current uh, economic crisis and back on the path to uh, economic prosperity is to create more good jobs in this country. We need to begin investing now in critical infrastructure, in water and sewer, uh, in energy, in our transportation and our communications infrastructure, as well as our public buildings, and that includes the 37,000 school buildings that President Obama has said that uh, he intends to upgrade and modernize. These are construction-oriented jobs. They will get people back to work. They will get money pumped back into our economy very quickly, and they will begin to rebuild America's economy. As that happens, we will then be, begin to have adequate revenues coming from the jobs that we've created to support schools, to support public education, and to support both local and county governments. Thank you very much for your concern and your dedication to public service. I believe if we have a project and, and it's privatized and we put it out for bid, we call the shots. We can decide to fix all of the neighborhoods. But we do need jobs. We need dollars. We need dollars coming in so that we have the money to pay for these projects. It all depends on how the money is being spent. If federal government would get rid of all of their 
departments that are oversight and strangling the private business sector and over-regulation, then the money would be back in Oregon. We would be able to decide where to spend those dollars. We could decide what projects are the most important. I have visited 10 countries other than the United States, and I can say for a fact, I couldn't wait to get back to the United States because infrastructure in other countries is far worse than what we have here. I don't want it to get there. So what we have to do is we have to create jobs and make sure that the money stays in the state of Oregon and we are only paying for Oregon's portion of national defense and national oversight so that all the states are treated equally. Other than that, Oregon will take care of its own and distribute the money so that we have less problems and more wealth. Joe, what you're describing is exactly why I want a 21st century WPA program that can put the over 200,000 people that we don't have working full time in Oregon back to work again. But the important part of your question is how do you pay for it? And here's how I would pay for it. Let's start by ending these Wall Street corporate loopholes that allow them to send all their money to offshore accounts and not pay their fair share of the taxes in this country. Let's end the Bush tax cuts for the top 2% and make the rich start paying their fair share in this country. And I don't mean in 2012. I don't mean at some nebulous future date. I mean, let's stop spending billions and billions and billions of dollars in three overseas conflicts and let's bring our troops home tomorrow. I gotta say something about public education because the other part isn't just money for public education, it's, it, it, it's the policy of public education. I am sick and tired of the federal government stepping into our local schools and telling us how to raise and teach our children and I will repeal the No Child Left Behind Act and bring music and art and physical education and shop classes back to every one of our public schools. Thank you. Thank you, Joe, for serving on a school board. It uh, shows your dedication to public education, and that's the reason why I got involved in the legislature and in politics, because of public education. We need a strong system of public education for our students. In this last session, I passed a bill reducing mandates on teachers and school districts. And I passed a bill limiting the number of times that students will have to retake a standardized test. And let's get rid of the parts of No Child Left Behind that label schools as failing and that overemphasize standardized testing. That will help with education. And yes, we need to invest in infrastructure. As I explained before, we pass cool schools here in Oregon. We need to get more schools retrofitted so that we're saving money uh, uh, with uh, energy bills as well. And we absolutely have to help small businesses so that we're revitalizing our economy and having more revenue to spend. You mentioned, Joe, privatization. I oppose privatization of public services. I have respect for those who work in the public sector. And privatization has not worked very well. When I've seen it uh, attempted, it doesn't work. We value our public employees, and that's the way I will uh, act as your next member of Congress, to make sure that we are rebuilding our infrastructure, strengthening public education, reducing an emphasis on standardized testing, helping small businesses, and respecting those in the public sector. So thank you again, Joe, for your work on the school board.